Okay, that's better. All right, well, that was a hard introduction to follow, but uh, <clears throat> today I want to talk not about the details of getting a model right. You know, that's the really fun part of domain-driven design and of uh, software development in general, I think. But as I was saying on Monday, and how many people were at the tutorial session on Monday? Okay, fair number. So the thing that motivated me to write all this stuff about domain-driven design and so on is that I've been on a lot of projects, and I've seen very different outcomes. And I became very weary of some of those outcomes. The outcomes were basically every now and then all the things that you think should happen with good design happen. You got sort of dramatically improved productivity and development. Your software is supple and responsive to users, changeable by software people. All of these things which we want to have happen. And then, okay, another outcome is we have a project failure. The project just does not pan out. That one is, of course, uh, not desirable, but it isn't one that distresses me greatly because I believe that when you do hard things, you will have some failures. In fact, I think that we should be much more tolerant of failure in general, but that's not the outcome that bothers me the most. The one that bothered me is that a lot of the projects that I participated on had what I would call mediocre results. If things went <coughs> okay, we, re we delivered something that met the spec, but uh, there was nothing about it that, was, that couldn't have been done in Visual Basic. <laughs> and so, probably it should have been done in Visual Basic, or we should have done the project in some different way. All right. Sometimes that was because we didn't do things right on the project. We didn't do a good job of modeling or design, or the team wasn't good enough, or the requirements weren't clear enough, and all those usual things. Sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes it was more about the strategy. The project was really set up to fail from the beginning. And that's why two-thirds, or rather, uh, over a third of the domain-driven design book is devoted to what I call strategic design. It's the last two-thirds, uh, the last third, so most people never get that far in a 500-page book, but that was one of my little mistakes. All right, so this talk, strategic design, making modeling valuable, because all that work that we did on modeling was really of no value, because we would have gotten the same result some other way. Now, not all of a large system will be well designed. How many people agree with me? Yeah, I hope everyone. How many people can admit that they don't consistently act like they believe that. Okay? That is to say, you are in some part of the system that's working okay, but you see some code that bothers you, it's not very elegant, and so you refactor it without a broader consideration. There are many things that we do that suggest that we don't really believe this. And I'm going to give some examples in a minute. And what happens when we don't really take this seriously is that uh, whereas this statement does not preclude some part of the system being well designed, it doesn't insist on it either. So we get systems where no part is well designed. Because we spread our efforts so thin, it's like boiling the ocean. Okay. I'm going to give an example of a project that I was involved in a couple, of, a few years ago. Uh, rather, I wasn't really so much involved. I was brought in to uh, consult with them about their plan. And uh, they actually wanted kind of a strategic view of what they were planning to do. And their situation was 
that they had a couple of legacy systems, which they actually had a large number of legacy systems, actually numbering in the hundreds, but they had a couple of fairly big ones that were actually doing some of their vital work. And um, they had, so they, those systems had served them well, but here's the thing, they weren't supporting the new features very well. So, here is in my sophisticated notation, a representation of a couple of legacy systems. You know, that's what legacy systems are like. They gradually become a little formless. And the thing that was interesting was that they observed was that more and more, not only was it hard to add features to these two legacy systems, but that more and more the, the features they wanted were actually in the relationship between the two systems, the, the nice, clean, elegant new system at one shot. So they had a phased project plan. In the first year, they would do the infrastructure technical issues and some of the basic uh, business service layer stuff. And then in the second year, they would focus their efforts on reproducing the functionality of the legacy system. That would give them, in the third year, a platform on which they could develop really nice new features. And so, you know, now this is a very familiar <coughs> plan to me. It's one I've seen before. It's one I've done before. And sadly, it always ends the same way. <laughs> Now, year one is fun. You get to do everything that the latest articles tell you to do, and use the latest technology, and evaluate, and set everything up. And year two starts out pretty well, too, because that part of the system that has been bugging you for years and years, you get to go in and say, well, this is the way it really should be, and rebuild it. And it's nice. And you build another piece of the old system. After a few months, though, you notice that maybe you've rebuilt 10% of the legacy system, and already half the year is gone. And you start to run into these messy situations, like, well, you know, this field in the legacy system is actually used for three different things in very conditional ways. <laughs> and all three of those turn out to be important functions, and so we've got to sort all this out. So there, and then, of course, we've just got a big, you know, huge sort of flow chart of if then else's. So we've got to reanalyze the whole thing. And what it turns out is that this is really not, you know, not anything like a one year project. So we extend our time, of course. Uh, we'll spend a year and a half on that legacy replacement phase. And, of course, a few months later, we realized that's not even close either. <laughs> At which point, we just say, well, we can cut a few corners. And the corner cutting accelerates and accelerates and accelerates as we converge on the latest possible date that anyone will let this project survive before they just finally flip the switch off. And so finally, we're just porting over wholesale. And at the end of the third year, we do have a legacy replacement system that does just what the old system did, but on a platform that <coughs> is technically newer, but has essentially the same model as the old system <laughs> had, too. And that doesn't really make anyone happy. They feel immense relief that your project is over. <laughs> And the year three, remember the year three? The, we've, we've already gone three years, but year three was supposed to have been building exciting new features on the new platform. Year three never happens. In fact, year three sort of already happened because while you were working away on that building the pyramid thing, they couldn't really wait for those features. They really needed those features. And those features were being built where? Well, in the legacy system. <coughs> So turning off the legacy system isn't quite as easy as it sounds. <laughs> it's a moving target. And so while they're pretty relieved your project is over, they want more of that. And 
then it can go different ways. Let's not dwell on it. <laughs> so, the general approach of, you know, replacing a legacy system in this way is an example of a bad strategy. Now, uh, the um, kind of agile alternative put forward usually would be, let's refactor it. So, in a similar way, but through successive refactoring, we're going to bring about the same new, nicely structured system. Okay, and, and in fact, it does avoid some of the problems, right? What's going to happen with this? It's been long enough now we've actually had, had a chance to try this a few times, too. Well, so at least we don't have that problem where the real work is going over on the legacy system, and we're stuck here, you know, sorting out what that field does. But still, the, some of the same things apply, right? It's still hard to figure out what the heck that field that does three things is. So you do a lot of analysis work, and there is a lot of legacy system there. And so you'll probably start picking away at some of the easier parts and some of the parts that are more gratifying. Like, uh, oh, you know, there's that time management part that always seemed like you had a better idea. One of the things I've noticed is that there is a deep structure, a kind of a set of deep assumptions built into most software systems. And this goes as well for very well-designed systems as it does for slapped-together messes. Those deep assumptions are really hard to change. It's like, suppose that this building, you know, you wanted to change this building. There are certain kinds of changes you could make. It's currently a kind of hotel conference center, and if you wanted to make it a uh, condo, with some shops at the bottom, maybe you could do that. Or if you wanted to maybe turn it into offices, but if you wanted to radically change the nature of building it was, suppose you wanted to make a uh, football stadium. Well, you aren't going to transform this building into a football stadium. To do that, you'll have to build a new, you know, you just tear it to the ground and build a new one. And so that's kind of the situation that we often get in when we're trying to refactor. But there's another thing going on, of course. As you're going around cleaning up this and that, and to the extent that you are good at this, you can actually make some headway. But the nature of the legacy is there are other people working in it. And every time you make a clean new section, someone finds this to be an opportunity to get their feature done a little quicker and so you go back a little while later, and it's not so clean anymore. Pretty soon you're running in a little circle. Has anybody ever experienced this frustration? It's just like an endless process. You, and, and one of the, for example, the basic things you have to do is you have to reduce the coupling. So you carefully decouple something, and it just takes a line of code somewhere to recouple it again. <laughs> and uh, that's the reality that you're in. So this one doesn't actually ever lead to that elegant structure. No, I, don't, I won't say it never does. I think it depends on many things. It depends on how deeply you're changing assumptions. It depends on how clean the code base was to begin with, whether or not you have a lot of those kind of irresponsible people running around. I believe you are, generally speaking, responsible. And by that, I mean you care about the impact of what you do on the whole system, on the company, and so on. That's, you know, the kind of people who tend to come to conferences. But not everyone feels that way. And a lot of times, even responsible people, or people who would like to think of themselves as responsible people, they make irresponsible decisions so that you will essentially incur a lot of design debt. Now, and then there are people who simply, uh, you know, don't know what they're doing and they incur a lot of design debt too. 
I have a theory that I've said a number of times, which is that the quality of the design or the code that's coming out of your project is roughly going to correspond to the second worst programmer on the team. I used to say the worst programmer on the team, but I've more recently revised my estimate. And there's a reason. Everybody knows who the worst programmer on the team is. Everybody's watching them, following them around, undoing everything they do. <laughs> that leaves one person left to actually do all the work on the project. That's the second worst program. <laughs> so, the refactoring doesn't help you escape. You know, it doesn't get you out of that old system the way that rebuilding does. There is a third approach you could take. Let's just hack, let's just build the new features, you know? We'll just do all this stuff. And you will get new features that way, right? You will at least deliver something the business needs now, and you'll deliver it now. Your pace will slow down as you go, as it tends to do. But so far, it seems like that's what's going to happen anyway, right? So let's just, let's just accept it and let's all, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Okay, well, that's not really what I'm going to recommend, but <laughs> I feel that way on some days. But fortunately, I uh, already had made this slide set so, so that just in case this was one of those days, I didn't just, you know, bring down a room full of a hundred people and send you home ready to quit your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. There are certain kinds of bad strategies that I think that serious software developers are especially prone to. And one of them, for example, is let's build a platform to make other programmers more productive, presumably lesser programmers. Now maybe they really are lesser programmers, or maybe they're not, but you're just, you know, condescending jerk. But either way, it, it has the same result. And, and really, uh, you know, this one's been tried and tried and tried. It's the typical architecture team versus development team thing. It's, it's many things. But design leverage turns out to be an illusion in these situations. Uh, and uh, in some cases, it's worse than that because it kind of, well, uh, I'll, I'll get to some of the other uh, consequences later. Cleaning up other people's mess. I just, it, I come to the point where I say, don't clean up other people's mess. Unless you've established certain kinds of boundaries in the meantime. Cleaning up other people's mess is a, is a losing situation. One sloppy programmer can produce enough mess to keep any five top-notch developers busy. <laughs> and so, if you, it just, it's a no-win thing, but it's one that you slip into, you slip into by little steps, right? It's very hard to resist. So what do you do instead? Oh. Well, I will get to that, but I'm going to make you even more depressed first. <laughs> All right. The sloppy hackers are going to look even better because every time you clean up their mess, you will enable them to go faster. Has anyone here ever done this? The somebody has introduced a really crucial instability into the system in their, you know, effort to get some feature out quick. And it's going into production soon. And you sound the alarm, you say, this person is sloppy. This person has made a mess, and this mess is going to cost us. We can't release that to development because something bad will happen. Maybe data corruption. Maybe the system will collapse. Who knows what will happen? Well, I mean, you'll, you'll presumably be more specific.
like a nice feature, nobody listens. And so, do something about that. And I roll up your sleeves, and you, you and me, responsible colleagues of yours, fix it. release. And soon, nothing bad happens. The part that you've saved the day here is, hey, I've delivered you this feature that you really needed. From you, they hear, yap, 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 yap. He's a bad guy. Nothing happens. People's messes. Another proposition is rebuilding art. I mystically expect that there's some sexy newness to a project like that. That was the that was why possible approaches to a nice new system. That's what, because all it did was whole system, at least some new things. So rebuilding already is a loser too. Break these habits. Is of lead the organization into cold strategy. It, it guides us into the going a little further and a little design that is so enormous. And another thing, obscure the feedback. So, how does decisions, well, base it on their past experience. And so if their experience, they believe these design will pay off, then end up spending for a replacement to a exactly like the old one. Or every time they, they hear a warning from designers, it turns into a wolf. That is important. I'm not convinced that better to let that data get. No, it sounds <laughs> terrible. Well, he doesn't care about the company. Own ego. You know, important. It's important that the recognize to listen to. Uh, I think that's if you make the response, those are the people. That is the kind of strength in the future of design. I think this has actually happened over the last. 15 been in this. I have to update that there. <laughs> and, and when I started, high design was sort of at its peak of end with right all these months up front doing all this horrible and oppressive. Seriously then, you know, much more so, although uh, this are in many ways now than it was in his, that people are so skeptical of design. You know, Martin Fowler made about why design matter. You get to that point, and we haven't delivered on our good strategy. It isn't just your ego. It's better. What's a responsible designer? Briefly, to are described in that last part. The two. Name and context. Domain is, I'm using the term, is if you are writing soft banking is your domain. And <clears throat> the area that the user applies, that the user is using your program. Of course, domains for a main with many. And one of the things that I find most to start to carve those and categorize them. Very simple categorization scheme, three different categories. This category that I'll introduce you. If you're you know, shipping, domain is shipping, but the shipping business, my accounting is every business. But, and it's always essentially if it, it, a company is going to. Or with the examples, the uh, companies that by accounting have not, Enron comes to mind. <laughs> so, even want to be different. Support. These are specific to your business, perhaps. Really the thing that makes you special is what I call the core. I make it in a little font, really relatively small. It's the thing that makes your. Why didn't you buy your software? Or. At least, this, I'll give a couple of examples. Some feel it is a randomly chosen page. Any <laughs> features on this page it is this product. <laughs> and you might have come. I'm not going to start a book in one on one. You came to this page because you heard about this book and you wanted to buy the book. You might be more interested in you know, the free two day. <laughs> Make or break. It's a nice feature, and I'm sure, but product. I mean, another <laughs> same, similar product. <laughs> Free shipping. It's even better. Point something out. Here's a fills the other star right. In fact, uh, an aggregation. Many, many users of this. But the two different. Anybody? Probably most day. And star doesn't book. So this is a whole different box of core problems the function has. 
is hast between us who will never meet each other, who have never done business with you, business with each other again. eBay, from the start, was the big success that it was. really understood their domain, and they understood what their big part of their core domain was the issue. That star is a feature or domain, whereas the star I would classify that is in the domain. The trust between buyers. Now I'm not sure exactly. Essential. <coughs> just concerned with cool. could something like a scrum, making sure that these feet had a, a but we have a core domain. Just our emphasis a little bit. We want to build this feature because of, but to whatever we want to build tape and subdomain. We want to to build features. And that's the sort of thing good modeling. You hack a feature, but you need to create by hacking your way through. Here we are, space where design really matters. And a statement, not all will be well designed. This is that ought to be well designed. We'll make this assertion to our working in the quarter. So why do the, I'll bet most people at some point with why management darling is all cowboy coder for everyone else to mean that guy's the honor, probably in the quarter. Now if developers were working in the you would get instead the ability to find features and the better quality features in so but how can we make this happen? Flawed strategy but with our management that line that they wanted to let's replace the legacy. What part of that probably <coughs> all over? I mean, now, now uh, not so, I mean in the new system that I think this. I think, remember the plan, bottom of the pyramid, base, basic infrastructure. Second year, we replaced, that was, but the middle already had. Well, oh, exciting new feature. Demanding now, the things that the can work right now. And that was that top. And all of this is enable that. Rebuild all that stuff. They wanted to rebuild it. Build that, those as integrations between those legacies. So all this, so mostly support. So what you have is an original plan. You're spending the generic and generic, all that basic infrastructure. The second year, if it had, it would have, if that still was, hadn't already moved on strategy. Uh, of course, we found the same place. Now, the question that comes to mind to them, well, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Thinking of when you said, I think with the legs core here, a little there, a lot out here too, because they were part of the most important things they were additions between these two systems. I think that was a good place to be key business functionality. So, of course, those old systems, fairly badly designed to begin, they, uh, focus very core business if the core domain shifts around the things that are today are not necessarily edited five or ten years now. and so we have then the cycle in which we replace enable us to work in this and so that's what which is us build this is what I want to and we could by just hacks you can always do check but that is self all understand in a better way that's uh, Yes. Now, we digress a little more. Some people, let's, here's a UML diagram, it's a certain, this is not a model, any dimension. The representation of a model, communication for, it isn't the model itself. Here is a map of the domain, is, this map happens to be a 16th century. It is a beautiful map, but in a certain way, all China world here. Of course, the hundred years before this map had a fleet of ships exploring. Why is it that people who make a map like that? Of course, also they had ships and the isolation society. And one way of looking at this map, it communicates a certain domain, in this case the geography. This model says, this is the important, important center where you should focus your attention. And this all, maybe it would be ideal if you could, can't ignore it completely in the edge of the map. you fixated on it. But a good model can do is help you what's important. Here's another of a model of... 
Right? So, something, this is the sense of made. Something no longer does the, you know, they, they draw their this big. And, you know, you can see, here's, here's China, and they look about, them, and they are, so, this map represents size. That it does make, re like, say, uh, and, uh, so, did they find out that, now I have two theories, that, this map, there were, <laughs> <laughs> that's the reaction everyone gets, <laughs> seems all would suggest that, anyway, okay, so, now, it is that, when it's on a surface, of a flat surface, you have, and they distort it, and that made things in the big, and things at the equator, now, reason, but, one, this says right here, this, the Mercator projection, like any points, then a sphere projects them onto a plane. Uh, there are a infinite number of possible projections. This particular projection, at first, probably most people the map of the world. But of course, not the map. You've all, let's say, that they can think should appear and stretch down here, various continents. In
There was a particular reason that this map was, this projection was used. And it's simple. You draw a straight line from, say, New York to London, measure the angle, do a simple calculation, and you will have a compass heading, a direction. And you take your sailing ship and you keep it on that heading and you'll arrive at that destination. This was designed as a navigator's map hundreds of years ago, before GPSs and however they do this now. It allows you to do a very important calculation that has a lot of data involved very simply. This is exactly what we use models for in software. So, I think this is a nice example of, uh, well, a representation based on a model. So, to me, a model is not a UML diagram or a map or any of these things. It is a system of abstractions, which can sometimes be used to make such things, communicated through those things. A system of abstractions that describe selected aspects of a domain. Making the model definition a little more broad is important to my next point. But I want to emphasize this part. It can be used to solve problems related to that domain. A model that we have no particular use for is of no interest. So, this suggests that our goal is not, as I often hear, to find a model that is as realistic as possible. That's not our goal. Our goal is usefulness. And usefulness is always specific to some scenario, something you want to do with that model. I want to find the direction, I want to know the compass heading that I need to stay on to get to London. And there are always multiple models. There are multiple models of geography of the world that range as far from a part as, you know, this is the center focus here to Here's how you get from New York to London. And there are multiple models on your project and on every software project that I have ever seen. They're coexisting, to in, sometimes in peace and sometimes not. Here's an example. So, it was six men of Indostan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. And so most people are familiar with this, the story of the elephant and the blind man, and they, one of them touches the side and thinks it's like a wall. One of them touches the trunk and says, this is like a snake. One of them touches the tail and says, well, this is like a rope. And one of them touches the leg and says, it's like a tree. Each one has formed a different conception of what an elephant is, a different abstraction of an elephant. And as it points out here, and so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. Because, of course, with bottles, we don't care that much about realism. At least not the ones we care about for software. Here's a UML representation of the poem. <laughs> <laughs> this, I find, is the effect that UML has on beautiful thoughts. And <laughs> 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 So, we have four models of elephant. This one's a subclass of wall and tree and snake and rope. Now here's the thing. If those blind men just, I mean, why do they care what the other blind men think of what it's like? They get argued. But why? What is the point of all that arguing? Well, there might be some point, but, uh, you know, as we say, 
each is partly in the right, they're all in the wrong. This actually, in the poem, uh, is a metaphor for understanding God, and so everyone's seen different aspects. And so I think that's why they care. But, but you know, if you were on a software project, would you really care? The thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, it's fine there are multiple ways of looking at everything, as long as they don't exist in the same context. So, by that I mean, you know, a word or a phrase doesn't have an intrinsic meaning. If I say, I want to go home, and let's say I said it now, you might interpret that as well. Maybe he wants to go upstairs to his hotel room. Or maybe at the end of the conference, you would interpret it as maybe he wants to get in an airplane and go to his home city. Or if I was standing on a baseball field, you might have a completely different interpretation that I want to score a point in the game. And models are like this, too. A model doesn't just have a meaning. It isn't just a thing that you can say exists like the true model of something, or, or a model that you can just plug in. It exists in some context. It has meaning in some context. So, remember the first of those techniques that I talked about was distilling the core domain. And I defined those three categories and said we really need to focus our attentions on the core domain. How could we do that? Now we have another tool to bring to bear. What called the bounded context an operational definition of where a particular model is well-defined and applicable. What is it that makes, why did they want to work in that little top of the pyramid instead of in those squiggly lines and little dots throughout the old legacy system? Because they wanted to have control of the concepts that they were going to work with. They wanted to have control of the tidiness of the implementation. In other words, they wanted a bounded context that they could define the model they wanted in order to work on that. So here we have four models. And if we have four well-defined contexts, we might be just fine dealing with this. It could be, of course, that we have some integration to deal with. We might need <coughs> to agree on where the elephant is. And it turns out that these four blind men all have some notion of where the elephant is. It's part of each of their model. They call it different things. This guy calls it a location. This guy calls it a place. Location again. This, the rope guy called it a tie-down point for obvious reasons. We can translate between these things. And we can handle much more complex translations than that. So, having more than one context does not mean that we can't integrate. However, we could, of course, try to define a model, a single model of an elephant. We could say, well, we recognize that these different blind men have been touching different parts of the elephant. So the whole of the elephant is something like a combination of the parts that they have modeled. So we could say, for example, that an elephant is a kind of wall that, has, that is held up by trees and has a rope on one end and a snake on the other. <laughs> now, what we've done is we have unified the model of these four blind men into one elegant model. <laughs> Actually, this is <laughs> this is better than most of the models that we have on <laughs> Okay. Here's an example of a bad strategy that responsible people tend to fall into. Trying to unify everything. Trying to have one model. Uh, there's a little literary reference on that one, too. The enterprise model, it's called. Bad strategy. Better to say, as we do with, this is like the first thing we do with any new con client these days, is say, we need to draw a context map. We try to define what models are in play, what are their 
bounded context, if any, there can be flaws in those boundaries. What kind of translations are going on? What integration points are there? And how are the how are the concepts being transformed between? And there's a lot to this. And there's a whole chapter in the book which I'll refer you to. And we have whole classes that focus on this. But basically that's the concept. And so um, this, is, this is going to be the other tool. By the way, here of course is the model that most people are going to draw in a class about modeling. Right? This is what an elephant really is. An elephant is a kind of animal. Animals have tails and legs. Elephants also have trunks. Now, maybe you could eventually, with great effort, and a lot of work with experts in the field, zoologists maybe, maybe you could eventually come close to a model like this. And I would ask, if you could, should you? Should you put all that effort in? And what do you think my answer to that would be at this point? Is it in the core domain? That's the answer, right? If it is in the core domain, it is worth trying for this. You might not get it. You'll get as close as you can. If it's not in the core domain, though, what you need is, at best, that an elephant is a wall held up by trees with a rope and a snake. That's the best that you would possibly need. You need something good enough to do whatever it is that supporting domain does. But in the core domain, we assume that there's value in being really, really good. So we need to know what the core domain is. And then we need to find a good model for it. And we need to build software based on that model. But the thing is, precision designs are fragile things. If I you know, if you live here in Vancouver and you say, I'd like to grow some tropical orchids. So you get some bulbs in June and you plant them. And they come up and they look nice. And they're going along just fine in August. And then in September or October, they start to look a little off. And by November, they're dead. And why is this? Well, obviously, this is not a tropical climate. Tropical orchids will not grow here. But yet I can go down to a flower shop and I can get tropical orchids any day of the week, even in January. So how is that? They're not flown in daily from the Amazon. They're grown around here, probably somewhere. And how do they do it? A greenhouse. Everybody knew that, but you were afraid to say it. They grow things in a greenhouse. Now, precision designs are fragile in that same way. The typical <coughs> environment of development in a legacy system is not conducive to their survival. Mm -hmm. This is why when you're refactoring, it doesn't work out that well because you fix a little thing over here and while you've got your back turned trying to fix another thing, someone comes and, you know, takes uh, and, and makes a mistake. And it can be a subtle mistake because they didn't really understand your intention and so on. So, in order for us to succeed with good design, we need the equivalent of that greenhouse. We need a bounded context containing a unified model. We need a clean, bounded context to work in. A bounded context is a very abstract idea, I know but it always takes a concrete form on a real project. So, how could we just build the core part? Well, one way, and remember, I'm only talking about one strategy. This is a strategy that I have used or have used with clients, and it has worked well. And I've seen it happen spontaneously in other places. One of the patterns that we describe in the domain-driven design book on the context mapping is called an anti-corruption layer. It is one way that two contexts might relate to each other. Basically, you build a wall. 
and you strictly regulate what goes through that wall. And basically, you've built yourself a greenhouse of sorts. So, imagine taking that approach. What we really want is a platform to do those new features. What we really want is a place where we can have the model that we choose, that model that says that an elephant is an animal with a trunk. And that means that we do need the part of the pyramid that's below the yellow part. But not the whole pyramid. We really just need the, the top, but not the very top, right? The second most top part. That's the platform. And how that's actually built. Here's where our physical metaphors start to let us down. Because, of course, you couldn't build a real pyramid from the top down. But you can build software that way. It's sort of, in fact, kind of a lean approach in the sense that it's pull, right? We say, well, what do we really want? We really just want that top part. What do we absolutely have to have in order to have that top part? Well, we need these abstractions. How can we support those abstractions? Well, one way would be to have a translation layer that would reach tendrils into the legacy system and draw upon the functionality there and translate it into this. Now, mind you, this is not easy or cheap. That translation layer could very likely will be more complex than the nice new software that you're building. Could take more time. But, one, it won't be nearly as big as the entire pyramid was. Two, you only build what you need. So, again, even this degree of physical metaphor lets us down. There's no physical equivalent to what you can do in software in terms of, I need these abstractions to do this first set of functionality. These abstractions being, you know, well, what I really want to do is make an elephant. And the abstraction I want to build that on top of is animal. So I'm going to make animal, but really I'm not interested in the legs part of the animal right now. I just need animal and, you know, that animals have tails. So I make that. Well, of course, I don't want to fully build that, so I'll cheat by reaching into the legacy system, taking what I need, transforming it, but an anti-corruption layer says there is a very, very hard barrier there. So I never see all that ugliness. This is one strategy. <coughs> Build a platform based on a model using an anti-corruption layer. This one is in a basically is what a project that I was involved did before I was involved with it. This project happens to be, have been in Vancouver and happens to have involved some people that are in this room. And uh, one of the authors say, right there, what they did, they, they had a legacy system, they wanted to build a nice new system. They didn't want to rebuild the whole legacy system immediately, so they built the part they wanted and they integrated with the other part through an anti-corruption layer. This is not an unusual thing to do. But what is unusual is to see it really clearly, what you're doing, and manage it cons you know, explicitly and consciously so that you, keep, you, you can stay on track. So, just to kind of wrap up, some kind of good strategical, clarify your context map, stabilize legacy systems, but then don't try to get rid of them, just you know, take them for what they're good for. Focus on the core domain. Get your core domain development into a clean context. That's really key. Deliver early and produce enthusiastic business sponsors. How do you produce enthusiastic business sponsors? Deliver in the core domain, right? Delivering a whole bunch of supporting stuff or generic stuff, or placing stuff they already have, that doesn't produce enthusiastic business sponsors. Delivering in the core domain. And you have to accept some consequences. Things such as thick translation layers, inelegant 
legacy systems that stick around for a long time, but stable. Inelegant, but stable supporting domains, because we're not going to take the time to make them good. Not all of the system can be well designed, and these parts are the parts that are not well designed. And we're going to accept that so that we can focus. Look for the assets in that legacy system that you need in order to do core domain work. And then work in the core domain. And don't be afraid to be the hero. There's nothing bad about that. In fact, it's very good for an organization to have heroes who are really good. And people will follow them and will set the pattern. Okay, well, I will just point you to couple of things. One, ebdcommunity.org is a good place to kind of get hooked into more of this kind of stuff. My own book, but specifically part four, which does tend to get overlooked because of a strategic mistake that I made in the structure of the book. <laughs> and uh, my own domainlanguage.com, the company that I work for. So, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be around for the next day, so anyone who wants to talk, I'll be happy.